Once Around Iron Stars. This is a story that I came across in reading a paper by the great Freeman Dyson. And it's the idea that eventually a very compact, dense star composed entirely of iron could be formed and become the dominant type of star in the whole of the universe. Now, the reason for this is that iron, iron 56 to be precise, is the most stable of all of the possible nuclei. The binding energy for the neutrons and protons held together in iron 56 is the greatest. Isotopes, nuclei less massive than this, tend to want to uh, reduce their energy by forming iron, and heavier ones want to do it by splitting up. You can see this graph here, starting at hydrogen on the left and going all the way to the heavy elements such as uranium on the right, and the peak of the graph is iron. Now, what happens in stars is, of course, that the light elements, hydrogen first of all, is fused to form helium, releasing a lot of energy, and then on to carbon, oxygen, neon, and so forth, all the way up to iron. And it's only in dying and exploding stars that we get to create nuclei that are heavier due to the enormous burst of neutrons that result from the collapse of giant stars. That's when you get the buildup of heavier and heavier nuclei, but only in such extreme conditions because they really well, they become radioactive in eventually uh, once you get them to be mo massive enough and they want to split apart again. But the creation of the elements by fusion all the way up to iron really is something of a quirk of nature. It's down to the fact that quantum mechanics allows what are, at first sight appear to be impossible things to happen. This is a process called quantum tunneling. If you have two hydrogen nuclei and you try and ram them together, the electrostatic repulsion of the two positive charges will push them apart again. And to bring them very, very close together takes an enormous amount of energy and therefore a very high pressure and high temperature environment. But if you do bring them close enough together, then they come within the range of the strong nuclear force, which grabs them and forms a heavier nucleus, um, and that is fusion. But it only actually happens in stars because the nuclear fusion can occur early at lower temperatures and lower pressures than the simple mathematical theory would suggest. The two separate hydrogen nuclei are able to tunnel through the repulsive energy barrier and get captured by the strong force, as opposed to climbing over the top of it. And Richard Feynman summed this up very nicely, saying everything that is not forbidden is compulsory in nature. In other words, it may appear to be impossible to climb this narrow energy barrier and get close enough to have the strong force win, but nature allows this so-called impossible tunneling through of the energy barrier, as long as that energy barrier is tight enough. Essentially, what's happening is that the particles borrow some energy for a short period of time and are able to miraculously make their way through the barrier without having to have the enough energy to climb all the way over the top. And that's a consequence of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that the uncertainty of energy and the uncertainty of the time window in which you are examining it um, must multiply together to be non-zero, to be always greater than Planck's constant. So you can borrow energy for a very short period of time in large amounts 
um, as long as you pay it back again afterwards, and the great cosmic accountant will be happy. And so in the core of stars, where you have more than 10 and a half times the mass of the sun, you will get elements forming all the way up to iron by this nuclear fusion. But once they uh, get to iron, they can't then release any more energy by fusion. They will start to create less efficient nuclei of the heavier masses, and uh, that's bad for them because it spells their absolute doom. Once they're not generating energy by fusion, they might be making heavier nuclei, uh, but they soon find that the energy is taken away in their process, sapping the star of its energy and it's reducing its core temperature. And if you reduce the temperature, then you find you can't do fusion as efficiently. So you get a very rapid switch off of nuclear fusion. Literally, the core can die in a millisecond and then gravity wins and crushes it down into a uh, forming a supernova this is also just illustrated in this uh, diagram again so the star can't sustain fusion because it begins to cost energy creating the heavy nuclei that really uh, energetically speaking would want to split back apart again um, and uh, form the most efficient element iron and so you get this rapid cooling and the star falls in when the core is just composed of the light elements all the fusion reactions were yielding energy but once the iron has built up the probability of a collision between two nuclei involving one of the iron or heavier mass uh, goes up and as the fraction of those heavier collisions increases you get um, more and more loss of energy and the power output of the core rapidly falls off essentially iron and heavier elements poison your nuclear reactor the fraction of energy yielding events decreases the fraction that sap energy increase and the power exponentially falls off so as the temperature uh, controls the rate of fusion actually the rate is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. It's a very, very sensitive process indeed. So a small drop in temperature res results in a massive drop in the rate of uh, that fusion, the rate at which things are able to quantum tunnel and stick together. So the fusion stalls out, drops away in just a few milliseconds. The core collapses, lower temperatures mean lower pressures, gravity wins, the core implodes. And that implosion actually crushes the cloud of electrons. This is the first time the electrons really become important in a star. Everything up to now is really dominated by the uh, protons and neutrons and the nuclei. But the electrons are nevertheless there in equal numbers. You have equal numbers of negative charges to positive charges. But because electrons are much lighter, they have to move a lot faster to have the same energy. The kinetic energy of motion is a half m, the mass, times the square of the speed. So if you have a lower mass, then v squared has to go up for the energy to be the same. And the average energy of a system is the temperature. So if you want to have the electrons have the same temperature as the nuclei, they have to be moving a lot faster. If they're moving a lot faster, then in any given small time window, they will have taken up more space. And therefore, they are going to become the dominant space-filling entity as the pressure goes up. And so they are the first casualty when gravity starts to overwhelm everything. They are rammed into the protons and converted into a neutron and a particle called an electron neutrino is spat out. Now, 
that makes perfect sense because the uh, neutron takes up around about the same space as the proton and about 200 times less than the electron was taking up. So it's much, much more efficient to pack things together as balls of neutrons. And the little neutrino, well, that doesn't interact with very much very easily and shoots out through the star, although it does become important as an energy carrier in the detonation that then follows. So you turn your ball of nuclear matter and cloud of electrons into a ball of neutrons, and you have a neutron star, and it is the pressure of being unable to crush the neutrons that brings things to a halt, provided uh, the gravity is unable to overwhelm that as well. Of course, it's possible that if the star is particularly large, the collapse will go further, and there's a whole story about the possibility of taking the neutrons and forcing them to break up into quark soup and create quark stars, or indeed collapse further to create black holes and I have videos all about strange uh, matter, quark stars, and black holes for you to enjoy as well. But what happens? if we manage to avoid that fate, you'll still get the situation where random reactions are causing fusion of heavy elements and sapping energy. And so the temperature will fall and the collapse is then all about whether electron degeneracy alone, the pressure of electrons can hold back gravity. And there might be a mass at which this works. We know that this is in fact what white dwarfs are. White dwarfs are stars of lower mass where the core is unable to overwhelm the electron degeneracy. And usually those are carbon oxygen dominated white dwarfs. Sometimes we've seen a few that are pure helium and possibly some that have slightly heavier elements such as neon and magnesium in them. Um, but there is a possibility that just in a few cases, it's teetering on the brink of that iron core collapse stage. And so it could be that you had a ball of iron formed that just fails to collapse. You could end up in a kinetic balance between heavy elements splitting to form iron and fusion creating iron at just the right rate. And if you do this, the temperature, of course, is going to drop as the uh, heavy elements are formed, but be increased again as the uh, fission occurs and the heavy nuclei split up. And gradually that heat will be radiated away to the environment. And so the system could cool and freeze out to uh, being stable. And if it did so, then the stable state would be that anything smaller than iron would have fused up to it, and anything heavier than iron would have fissioned back to iron. So it's possible that you could create a ball of iron. There's a little diagram showing how the heavy elements like thorium and radium tend to decay downwards. And in this particular diagram, they seem to stop at uh, the element lead isotope 208, which is marked as stable. So we start with thorium and it decays all the way down to there. So why not all the way to iron? Well, in fact, the reason is that we describe these things as stable, but they are less energetically favorable than the iron nucleus would be. They are in fact metastable, stable, except they have incredibly long half-lives. And one particular version, bismuth 209, was uh, discovered in 2003 to have a half-life that was measured at 2 times 10 to the 19 years, an absolutely monstrous length of time, over a billion times longer than the age of the universe. So that's incredible and so although to all intents and purposes for 
human operations, bismuth 209 is stable. It's not really. It will eventually decay. Um, now, that's not the record holder. There's an isotope of tellurium, tellurium 128, where the half-life is 7.7 .7 times 10 to the 24 years. And this is because it has a very peculiar way of decaying a decaying uh, double beta decay involving uh, the destruction of two electrons at the same time. That makes it a very freaky and rare process. And so it takes a very, very long time. But again, all of these stable nuclei are subject by quantum tunneling to decay. And that includes even the ones we think of as completely stable, like lead 208. And so if light elements are eventually going to fuse and heavy elements to fission and end up at iron if you give them long enough. Well, the question really was, how long is long? And the paper by Freeman Dyson about iron stars has a whole lot of mathematics in it where he reasons and calculates that you could after the utterly, utterly immense time frame of 10 to the power 1,500 years, see all the other nuclei either fuse or fission to form balls of iron, iron stars. Absolutely incredible story. Utterly irrelevant to anything that's going to happen in any reasonable time scale. And there are other theories of the cosmos that suggests that many other bad things are going to happen before this. Um, it may not be possible for these things to form, but the theory of uh, the processes involved in, in the nuclear reactions seems to suggest that it is. One factor that might interfere with the formation of iron stars is the fact that ultimately protons themselves might not be stable. They appear to be. Every experiment that we have uh, attempted shows that their half-life must be longer than at least 10 to the power 34 years for a proton splitting to give an anti-electron, a positron, E plus, and a neutral pion. Um, but 10 to the 34 years is a lot less than 10 to the 1500. And so if protons can decay, and then uh, presumably neutrons can also go by this route as well, then perhaps the ultimate decay won't be to form these iron stars. So a fascinating prospect. And uh, so far into the far distant future, that I'm sure that other factors, such as dark energy, if it exists, um, and uh, the collapse of the universe, if it doesn't, um, and black holes forming instead, can all influence this. But a really, really interesting chain of thought. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening.